Good morning, everyone. So good to see you all. You can take your seats. Thank you. Isn't it just incredible to be together in God's house? My husband, Paul, and I lead the Hope family together. He's not here at the moment. He's actually in a very remote area where there is no reception. We've got some pictures of our team up in Zambia where they visited Hope family last Sunday. I don't know what Paul was doing in a panel there, but it looks like a lot of fun. I know he was preaching as well. Our son shared, and apparently it was just the most joyful time ever in church with Hope Family and Hope Mongo, where it all actually began in 2008. And then they left for a rural village to go and plant churches, as I knew they would. But then I just got a WhatsApp from Paul saying, I don't think we're going to have any reception. I was like, oh gosh, he's like, I love you. I'm like, I love you. <laughs> and then I didn't hear from him after one day and day two. My motto when we lived in Zambia for 10 years was, no news is good news. So um, I then asked our church planting leader in Mongu, so what exactly did they go and do and where are they? So he said, no, our team will be planting five churches in areas where people have never heard about the name of Jesus. It's completely unreached. But then a few days later, I got a phone call and I didn't recognize the number. I thought somebody wants to sell me something, but thank goodness I answered. And I heard, shh, oh, hello, baby. And I'm, Paul, hello, how are you? And I couldn't hear much that he said, but I did hear, everyone's healthy, lots of salvations, going well. And I'm sure you pretty much heard the same from this side. But how good is our God? And you know, that is how it is with hearing God's voice. Sometimes we, we can't hear clearly and we, we try and tune in and listen. But because we've taken time to spend time with God and to listen to his voice, we recognize his voice. And we can step out in obedience. We serve an amazing God. But today I, I want to talk about the love of our Heavenly Father. It's something that's really been on my heart as I lost my own father six months ago. And this year was the first Father's Day that, well, I said Happy Father's Day on Facebook. But I mean, you know, it's, it's very different not having your dad this side of heaven. And I was very close to my dad. I loved my dad. He was Paul and my biggest cheerleader ever. Like we would preach or do something in our community and he would send us, that was amazing. That's the best. Never seen anything like that. Well, like you said it last week. Yeah, but this one is even better. It is just so amazing. So I know not everyone had an experience with a good father. And I'm very sorry about that. Um, it has helped me a lot, understanding the love of my heavenly father. You know, but like the last few months, I started feeling, am I a little bit less loved now? You know, I know my husband loves me. I know my children love me. I know our church loves me. But not having my dad here, you have those like, am I a little bit less loved? Not at all. And I want to encourage all of us here, even if we've lost loved ones, even if we never experienced that love from a parent here on earth, our heavenly Father's love is enough. We can feel completely loved by Him because He is sufficient for us and He is all that we need. Isn't that just amazing? We serve an amazing Father. So I've been thinking a lot about my heavenly Father's love for me because it's so important that we know He loves us. I want to ask you a question. What does God think about you? Think about that. What is God's opinion about you? Is he shaking his head? Like, no, just making mistakes again. Or is he rejoicing over you because of the person he's making you to become? Is God just focused on your past? Or is he dreaming about your future? So how you answer this question greatly impacts how you see God and how you approach God, and how you live your life. If you see God as a disinterested, harsh judge, you're going to live hopeless. <laughs> and if you see God as a demanding taskmaster, you're going to live full of fear. 
We're going to approach him with fear. But if we see God as a loving, kind, compassionate, heavenly Father who cares deeply for us, we're going to live lives of peace and joy and hope for the future. So before we continue, let's pray and commit the rest of our time into God's hands. Father God, thank you so much that we're in your house today and that we can talk about the love of our Heavenly Father because we are so loved. Lord, but I pray for all of us that we'll leave here today with a greater revelation of your love for us, our Heavenly Father's compassion and love for us, God. Lord, I pray that you'll help us grasp and understand how high and long and wide and deep your love is for us and that nothing can ever separate us from your love and that your love for us is enough. So we just open up our hearts to you and we say, come and touch us today, Lord. Come and speak to us. Come affirm us, Lord. Help us understand your love for us as your children. In Jesus' name and all God's people say, amen. In the Bible, we see Jesus used to love telling parables. A parable really is a simple, memorable story that teaches us spiritual truths. And we're going to look at the story today of the lost son. And then seven things that we see how this father loved his son and how our heavenly father loves us. Some of you are familiar with the story of the prodigal son, and this father had two sons, an older son and a younger son. Jesus tells a story, and the, one day the younger son said, I want to go. I want my inheritance now, and the father said, well, okay, I'll divide my estate. He gave him his portion, and he packed all his stuff a few days later, and they went off to a faraway land to another country. He lived a wasteful life there. He just partied. He was wild. And right about the time all his money ran out, a famine swept over that faraway land, and he was in trouble. He was starving. So he actually went to beg at a farmer in this country that he found himself now in, and the farmer gave him a job to feed the pigs. And he actually even wanted to eat the food that he was feeding to the pigs. But then he actually came to his senses the one day, and he said to himself, my goodness, my father's servants actually have nice food. And here I am licking my lips over pig's food. We pick the story up in Luke 15, verse 18. He says, I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. We do that sometimes, hey? When we want to go talk to someone, we play it over. Where do you do it? In the shower, in the car. And he says, and then I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. But I love how the son said, I've sinned against heaven and you. And it reminds me that when we gossip about other people or when we hurt other people, when, when we don't forgive other people, when we sin against others, we ultimately sin against our Heavenly Father. It's a good reminder, because sometimes we can disrespect someone or sin, <laughs> but we sin ultimately to God, to our Heavenly Father. And this has helped me a lot to know that how I treat people greatly impacts my relationship with God. So let's always remember that. Let's do everything as unto the Lord for His glory. Verse 20, so he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming, filled with love and compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to the, to the servants, quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast for this son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now is found. So the party began. But meanwhile, the older brother came back from working in the fields and he heard music and a party and he said to one of the servants, hey, what's going on? 
And the servant said, oh, your younger brother came back. The brother that was lost is found again. And your father said, we must kill the fattened calf. He didn't mention the rope or the sandals or the ring. He must have been hungry, I guess. <laughs> he said, we must kill the fattened calf because we're going to celebrate. And then the older brother got so annoyed and angry. Verse 28 says, the older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him, but he replied, all these years I've slayed for you and never once refused to do a single thing for you told me to do. And in all that time, you never gave me one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fat and calf. His father said to him, look, dear son, you have always stayed by me and everything I have is yours. We have to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now is found. You know, what I love about this father is he found both sons. He found the son coming back. He ran to him. But when he heard his older son was upset and wouldn't come in, he went to find him as well. He loved his children both. And why is we so much of, of my father? The older son is out of line. He has a, a, a self-righteous attitude. And some of us can relate to how he must be feeling, but he, he has to find forgiveness. But the, the father went to find him and he talked to him. Something that I will always remember about my own father is he valued his relationship with me more than being right. So I was a very outspoken teenager. I don't know if you want to say I was rebellious or what, but I always had a comeback, you know, and I was often very wrong. <laughs> but even though my dad knew he was right and I was wrong, at the end of the day, I knew he would come to me and he would come say sorry. And I would feel like I know I was wrong, but it meant so much to me, knowing I'm wrong, that my dad would come and apologize for the conflict and I would be, he loves me. And I always tried to do that with our children as they grew up and with other relationships as well. Let's just apologize because it shows the person we value them and our relationship with them more than being right. And God will guide us in that. So we're going to look at seven ways our Heavenly Father loves us. And the first way is He gives us the freedom to choose. He loves us so much He didn't make us to be robots. God doesn't force us to love Him, to serve Him, or to obey Him. In verse 12 it says, The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land, and there he wasted all his money in wild living. It was the custom at that time to only get your inheritance when your father died. But the son basically said, I wish you were dead, and give him my inheritance, and the father actually did. He gave it to him. He loved him enough to let him make his own decisions. He was old enough to make his own decisions. And God doesn't force us to obey his promptings. He's a gentleman. If we refuse to come to church or to read his word, he lets us make our own decisions. That's how much he loves us. He gave us freedom of choice. It reminds me a bit of my own life, how I went off the rails as a, a, young, a young adult. I went to do all sorts of things I shouldn't be doing, knowing it was wrong. But God let me make my own decisions, knowing the consequences will hurt me deeply. And guess what he did? He used all those things together for good. Because when I realized I can't do life at my own, on my own, um, I was in a bad car accident. And I felt lonely. I got Bell's palsy. We got paralyzed on the one side for eight months at the age of 21. So much went wrong. I, I can tell you a list of things. Eventually, I'm like, God, <laughs> I need you. So God will always pursue us back and use 
You, so, uh, I mean, what's the word? Stupidity is there a better word? And turn it for good for his glory. We serve an amazing, amazing God. Luke 15 verse 20, I say, so he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Who do you know? That's a long way off, <laughs> far away from God. I want to encourage you. God is waiting because our God is patient. Our Heavenly Father is patient. Don't give up praying. Don't give up asking. Don't ever give up loving. Be patient as our Heavenly Father is so patient. 2 Peter 3 verse 8 to 9 says, With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. The reason Jesus hasn't returned yet is because he's patient. He's waiting for so many people to turn to him, to make right with him, to give their lives to him. Luke 15 verse 20b says, filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him and kissed him. This heavenly father of ours is so compassionate. We can so easily look at the story and be more disturbed with the son's wastefulness. Huh? What all did he do? I want to know the details. But our God had just compassion on his state. He was lost. He was dead. He is so compassionate. And we can think of a million reasons why we can't come to God, why we can't come back to God. We all know our own stories. We know where we've been, the places we've gone to, not just physically, but in our minds and in our hearts. But God is so compassionate. He loves us so much. Does it mean our sin don't matter to God? Our sin matters to God. In fact, God hates sin. Why does God hate sin? He hates sin because it separates him from us. Sin causes us to drift away from him. And what God wants is to be close to us. He wants an intimate relationship with us. So what I love about this story is when the father saw the son coming, he ran to him. That's exactly how our heavenly father is. He sees the slightest move towards him and he moves towards us. The Bible actually says in James 4 verse 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. That's a promise. You move, God moves. Isn't that amazing? Because he's so compassionate. Verse 21 said, his son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Isn't it amazing that the son confessed after the embrace? The confession came after the kiss. The father accepted his son before his son even said a word. He knew what he was going to say. God knows what we're going to say even before we say it. Our heavenly father accepts us. The, son embra the father embraced his son wearing filthy rags. He must have stank. <laughs> Worse than a boy coming home from rugby practice. But the father didn't say, oh, <laughs> just go clean yourself up and then we'll talk. He embraced him. And the father didn't say, okay, you know, if you really hurt me, but come be a servant for a few years. And if you prove yourself, maybe I'll let you back into my family. No, he accepted him. He accepted him. But you know, with God, he accepts us just the way we are, but he loves us too much to leave us the way we are. But we don't have to have all our ducks in a row to come to him or to come to church. We make a big mistake when we think, no, I first have to get my life in order and then I'll come to God, then I'll come to church. And I hear people say this often and it's so sad. It doesn't work like that. We come as we are. 
and God will change us. His Holy Spirit will mold and shape us into the people that he wants us to be. Verse 22, but his father said to the servants, quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. The gift shows us that the son was restored. Our heavenly father restores us. The father restored his son. He restored his identity. He gave him a robe. And when we give our lives to God, we get a robe of righteousness. We become the righteousness of God. This is mind-blowing, but it's called grace. When, when we're in right standing with God, it means when we're saved, we're the righteousness of God. I can't get my mind around it, but some things we just need to accept. This is God. He's a gracious God that lavishes his gifts on us. And the son all, was also restored in his dignity. That's what the sandals represented because the slaves went barefoot, but he got sandals. And also he got a ring, like a signet ring. It was a ring of sonship. So he, he actually got his authority restored and he was now able to conduct the family business in the father's name. This is like just too, too good to be true. We don't deserve to be restored like this, but our God is so generous. It's because of his grace, not because we deserve it, that he restores us, our identity, who we are in Christ, and our authority and our dignity. Our God is a God who restores. Verse 23 the father said, and kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast. For this son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now is found. So the party began. Our heavenly father redeems us. The son was lost and he now is saved. And the party started in heaven. The singing has begun. Today, we actually water baptizing. We water baptize on the last Sunday of every month. We can't encourage you to take your next step of water baptism because that's what it signifies. We say, we are new in Christ. We once was dead, but now we are alive. When we go underwater, it represents us dying with Christ. And when we come out the water, it represents us being raised to life. Our God is a God who redeems. He takes us back. He rescues us. He saves us. What a heavenly father we have. Here's one I really like a lot. And you, maybe you with me. Our heavenly father defends us. Luke 15 verse 32 says, the father defended the younger brother. He said to his older brother, we had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he's found. This is a big one for me because I feel when we love each other, we need to have each other's backs and we defend each other. And this is something I had to learn. You know, people will misunderstand me. I will make mistakes, people will accuse me, but God will always defend me because there's absolutely no condemnation for us who are in Christ. And sometimes we just need to be still and know that God is for us so no one can be against us. But I'm just actually so grateful this oldest son didn't see the younger son first. <laughs> Hectic actually. He probably will, hey, you go back. Is that him? <laughs> What are you doing here? You have no place here. You heard our father. Go away. We're better off without you. Fortunately, the father saw him first. But I just want to say thank you so much, Hope Family, for not treating people like that. Everyone's welcome here to come and belong before they behave and before they believe. So we need to make sure we represent God well and we love people well. We need to love people. So the seven ways our Heavenly Father loves us that we can see from the story is that He gave us a free will. God loves us so much. He gives us the freedom to choose if we will serve Him or not. He says, choose. Choose life or death. But choose life so you and your children may live. We have the freedom to choose. And God is so patient with us. He's always waiting for us. And He's compassionate he loves us so much. He accepts us just the way we are. But he loves us too much to leave us that way. He changes us. And he restores us. 
and he redeems us, and he defends us. What a father we have. He loves us so much. I heard a pastor tell this story. It was at a men's event, and the church was packed with men. And during worship, he noticed in the front a father and his son, but the son was in a wheelchair. He was paralyzed completely, and he was blind. And he noticed during worship the father got his son out of the wheelchair and held him in front of him like this. And they looked, he looked at him. The son couldn't see him, but he could hear him. And this father sang over his son. The son could do nothing. He could just hear. And other men actually, it was a big teenage boy, and other men came and helped the son hold his son up. It's a true story. And he just sang. And it reminds me so much of Zephaniah 3 verse 17 that says, For the love your God, for the Lord your God is living among you. He is mighty. He's a mighty Savior. He will take delight in you with gladness. With his love, he will calm all your fears. He will rejoice over you with joyful songs. This is how God is with us. It's not about what we can do for him. We're all broken. We all fall short of the glory of God. But he loves us so much. And he sings over us. He rejoices over us. What do we do with a love like this? How do we respond to a love like this? You know, while we were still sinners... Christ died for us. He didn't wait for our confession before he died. <laughs> he proved his love for us on the cross. How do we respond? Just in this moment, if we can just all close our eyes and bow our heads, we can turn our back on God. We have the freedom to choose that and reject him. Or we can allow ourselves to be embraced by our Heavenly Father and let Him sing over us. We have the choice. But I want to encourage you here today. Maybe you are like the lost son and you need to come back to God. He's waiting with arms open wide. You move, He moves. And He's ready with a robe and sandals and a ring because He wants to completely restore you and redeem you. If that is you this morning, if you want to say, I want to come home. I've done life on my own. I want to be part of God's family. I want to give my life to him. Can you raise your hand just so I can see who to pray for? That's amazing. I see your hands there. I see your hands. Amazing. So many hands going up. Anyone else who want to join us before we pray? I won't make you stand or anything like that. It's just to show God you're giving your life to him today. Fantastic. I'm going to ask that we all stand in this moment and I'm going to pray and say a prayer of salvation where you coming home to God. The music is starting in heaven. The angels are starting to dance. But let's pray all together, especially if you give your life to God today. Father God, I'm coming home. I don't want to do life on my own anymore. I've decided to follow you. I want to be your child, Lord. Thank you for loving me so much that you send your son Jesus to die for me on the cross. Come and live inside of me. I'm turning my back on my old life. I'm now following you. And I'm so excited about my future with you. Thank you that you'll defend me. In Jesus' name. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Welcome to the family of God. If you've just given your life to him, that's amazing. There's no better choice you can ever make. We can do a bit better than that. Welcome to the family of God. Woo!